Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, my name is Henry Lau. Uh, I am the owner of Civic Nutrition. And so today I'm going to talk about systemic inflammation and just some factors that we can control in terms of nutrition and stress for our clients and how we can influence that. So starting off, I'm just going to give you kind of a foundational understanding of what inflammation is and some measurements we can take for that. Um, so we're going to start with that. So what is inflammation itself? Actually, everyone can hear me okay, right? Yep. Okay, cool. So basically, um, there's this, this is like the esoteric text. It's a response from input to our complex system that regulates the results in upregulation of biological pathways used to repair, protect, and clear out dead cells through the immune system and molecular mediators. So what does that really mean? Um, so in the real world, we have certain things that happen to us. So it can be like an acute stressor, or it can be something that's a biological process in the body that the immune system uses to basically clear out either dead cells or to fight infection off. And a lot of times, inflammation is not bad, but I think in our environment, what's happening is we're getting a lot of drivers from the environment to put us into a constant, like a constant state of inflammation, which is not good. So I like to break down inflammation into two different stages, acute and chronic. So let's go over first with systemic inflammation. So not just inflammation of maybe like an injury, like a knee, you bumped your knee or something, or we just had a workout where we have inflammation of the muscles, but overall, so systemic inflammation is basically inflammation driven by pro-inflammatory mediators. So some of you guys might know what cytokines are. Um, they can be uh, measured by IL-6 or some other blood markers we'll talk about in the, further down in the presentation. So, and also, I like to say chronic inflammation is more of the sustained activation of the immune system. So chronic, is, it's not necessarily chronic, but it's constant and it's sustained because of different drivers. And I think a lot of drivers that we can contribute or control is nutrition. And so this me basically talks about how we kind of just go through our daily life thinking, oh, it's okay to be chronically inflamed. And it's not. So inflammation pathogenesis. Uh, this basically talks about how chronic systemic inflammation can cause different types of diseases. And it's linked to all these different diseases. Most of them um, are actually autoimmune. Because of the systemic inflammation we have, we have a chronic activation of the immune system, which could lead to all these different types of pathogenesis. So there's also, Let's talk about the other side of the spectrum, because a lot of times I think we talk about too much inflammation, but lack of inflammation is also just as bad. So without it, we wouldn't be able to heal or recover, we wouldn't be able to fight off infection. But to talk more about in the strength world, there was a study that Roberts did, basically. He had people work out. There's two different groups. One group would work out and then not do anything after. The other group worked out and then jumped right into a cold immersion. And in this study, it showed that the group that used cold water immersion right after training blunted hypertrophy and strength response. So what's going on here? So I mentioned earlier about cytokines and IL-6, interleukin-6. That's used as a measure for systemic inflammation. And when you measure it in the blood, if you have high levels of IL-6, it's indicative of systemic inflammation. But when you, there's also IL-6 in the muscle. And when it's in the muscle, it's actually called a myokine. And IL-6 in the muscle is actually protective of inflammation, and the signaling response for that also helps with muscular hypertrophy and strength. And just to show, show another study too, so this study, they, what they did was they had untrained individuals that basically worked out. One group took ibuprofen right after the, uh, throughout the whole day, and then the other group didn't take any ibuprofen. And it showed that because of taking ibuprofen and NSAID, it blunted those strength and hypertrophy responses. So this is showing what happens if you have a lack of inflammation or you're blunting the inflammatory response. That's, uh, it's interesting because you have all these people that come to the gym and then always say like, oh, I take ibuprofen. You always, I'm always telling them like, no, try to get off of the consistent anti-inflammatory uh, because it, it blunts the, uh, the training effect. Yeah, I think, uh, I think like maybe like once in a while, but like, Taking constantly, taking NSAID is not a great idea. It's also, I'll talk about it at the end too, towards the case study. There's some really cool things with that. 
the, so Marcus is, the, I just want to ask a question about the ice water study because isn't there um, kind of a trend right now for people to do like post workout um, cold showers? Yes. So I, there is a time and place for cold water immersion or a cold treatment, cold therapy post workout. Yeah. I think when you are in a phase where you're basically deloading or you're going up to competition or you're in competition where you're not trying to necessarily make strength or hypertrophy gains, blunting the inflammation response from such as like a, like a performance perspective, like you had a game the day, the day of, and doing that actually helps with recovery. Because the main goal of you, the main goal is basically to recover and perform again. It's not necessarily to train and get better. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. So for markers of systemic inflammation, I'll just give you a couple of blood markers that uh, you can use in the medical field. So C-reactive protein, this is, this is pretty much uh, the standard, I would say. So high C-reactive protein will definitely be indicative of systemic inflammation. It, and these things here, these different markers, they're more of the canary in the coal mine. So like when you know that these markers are high, you know there's levels of stem inflammation. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's causing it though. So it's really important to kind of sit through with a doctor to go through these tests and be like, okay, like I know my C-reactive protein is really high. Like, why is that? And then kind of going through that. So we really can't pinpoint saying like, oh, just because IL-6 is high and C-reactive protein is high, like being kind of pinpoints of one thing. It takes, uh, takes a lot of different contexts and like uh, it's through the intake process to actually kind of pinpoint that. So everyday measures that we can take actually. So HRV is actually really good for this. Uh, what's happening with HRV is when we have a consistently low heart rate variability, the vagus nerve is basically unable to get activated. So what's happening is either we're having a chronic systemic driver of inflammation telling the vagus nerve to almost either shut off and it becomes into like a, it's almost like a spiraling pattern downward. We have these either environmental drivers from too much stress, too much workload, or bad nutrition, and it drives this HRV to be lower. So that's, that's really indicative of a, a systemic inflammation problem if you always have a consistently low HRV. And then nothing you can take if you don't want to take HRV, you can use your morning heart rate. So with this, it's, a, it's not as accurate, but what you're looking for is deviation. So any 10 to 15 feet deviations higher or lower consistently can show signs of systemic inflammation. An application, take all these measurements seated. So a lot of times you'll have some people take it when they're lying flat in their bed, and that makes it hard because now your heart doesn't actually have to work. So it might be just really low, and you get all these people with measurements like 50, 55, and they're like, man, they haven't done any cardio or they haven't done any type of cardio training. Why is their heart rate so low? It's probably because they're taking it laying down. So make sure to take all the measurements seated. And if you have any really high level athletes, such as marathon runners, you might have to take with them, you might have to take it standing. Um, you can use a heart rate monitor, a pulse oximeter. I like iFleet for HRV. Elite HRV actually was shown to be not valid from a study in the strength and conditioning, strength and conditioning journal. Um, I don't know if they've changed their algorithm lately, but this study has been pretty recent back in 2017. So I believe for HRV, elite HRV, maybe no. Now let's talk about nutrition, one of the biggest factors that we can control for systemic inflammation. So here I'm going to talk about omega-3s and how important it is. So the body of research shows that omega-3s have been shown to decrease inflammation and reduce the pathogenesis of many different diseases. And this is done through the assimilation of it into our cell membrane. So like basic biology, was a little bit behind that. So our, our cell membranes are made of a phospholipid layer that's made out of phosphorus and lipids. So in our developed world, we're eating a lot of different omega-6s that we've never been introduced or we haven't been able to get our hands on like this amount of omega-6s in our environment. And our body was just not made to adapt to that. So when we incorporate a lot of different omega-6s into our cell membrane, it becomes more pro-inflammatory as opposed to omega-3s that we can incorporate. So with that said, we're going to talk about omega-6 to omega-3 intakes and ratio. So most Americans have omega-6 ratio, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 17 to 1. What does that mean? So basically, they're getting about 17 grams of omega-6s to 1 gram of omega-3s. And you're thinking, oh, what, what does that have to do with anything? So depending on the context of the individual, 
So with these, these I kind of posted up basically showing you with people with different types of diseases or their different types of clients, you might need a lower omega-6, omega-3 ratio for a benefit. So you'll see with asthma patients, a five to one ratio showed that they had a beneficial effect. So basically the effect was that they had less incidences of an asthma attacks, whereas 10 to one had adverse consequences. So it's kind of a spectrum for everyone. So one ratio isn't necessarily like the best for everything. So then you see in the, in the second portion, the second two of 2.5 to one ratio reduced rectal cell proliferation in patients with colorectal cancer, whereas four to one had no effect. And then two to one ratio suppressed inflammation in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, which is huge. So for people that are, that have rheumatoid arthritis, they're basically constantly inflamed, especially at the joint. So it's autoimmune disease with a with the immune system is attacking the joint. So if you can suppress that, you can definitely save, definitely save them a lot of discomfort with that. And this research is actually from this study reference down here. I can email those to you guys later if you'd like. Awesome. So omega-3 intake. EPA and DHA are the key players. So the only sources you can get that from are algae, fish, and fish oil supplementation. So there's different types of omega-3s that you have, but the main ones that we'll need are EPA and DHA. Everything else in between or above that, they're just being used to be converted into EPA and DHA. So this is what we get. Usually we want about three grams of total EPA and DHA. You'll get that about six ounces of salmon, nine ounces of sardine, and 64 ounces of Pacific cod. That's a lot of cod, and you need that daily. So if you're eating 64 ounces of the Pacific cod, you're gonna be like this girl over here. Let's see if this plays. And it's not gonna be funny eating that much fish every day. So what about vegetarians? You have to supplement with algae-based DHA. That's like the only way you can do it just because, um, and you might think, oh, what about EPA? Well, DHA actually supersedes EPA because EPA is converted to DHA in our system. And it's really hard to source EPA from algae. So why is that? Well, the other thing too is if we eat a cup of flax seeds every day, you will get three grams of EPA DHA if that is you're converting at the optimal rate. So if you get all that alpha linoleic acid, you convert 8% at the full amount. Then you convert that EPA at 4% to DHA, you'll get about three grams. But the only thing is, if you eat omega-6s, it's going to convert, it's, oh, sorry, it's going to compete for those enzymes that convert ALA to EPA and EPA to DHA. So this is in a really controlled setting in like the perfect environment. And I don't think most of us are going to be avoiding omega-6s like that. So it's really hard to get all of our EPA DHA just from eating food. So omega-6 in the food, this is gonna be really important. So what has omega-6s? Basically, right here you can see one table seed salad dressing has four grams, six ounces of chicken thighs, six grams, and five ounces of nuts of seed is 34 grams. So anything that's processed, cookies, ice cream, potato chips, they have omega-6s. So what do you do now? Do you eat less omega-6s or do you eat more omega-3s? And we're going to talk about that in the case studies. So application. How much fish oil do you need? I'm going to use these examples right here. You have a 100-pound active male, and you have a 140-pound active female. And these macros are calculated to about 30% fat, uh, somewhere just around 40% carbs and 40% protein. Um, they can be shifted up or down a little bit, but I think most of us just looking at this can agree that's a pretty optimal diet for someone that's really active moving around. And now I'm going to break it down into actually the components. What are they actually eating now in these macros? Let's go for the male. So for the male, to get all that, we're getting 15 ounces of lean protein, one scoop of collagen protein, 32 ounces of sweet potato, three servings of fruit, five tablespoons of olive oil, one ounce of almonds, and three pounds of vegetables. So I think most of us can agree that's a pretty optimal diet. I mean, I don't even think I hit that six six times out of the week, this is really hard, like to get all that variance and all of those vegetables in. And even that, <laughs> oh yeah, Arnold said that's great. Um, even that has your omega-6, omega-3 ratio of 12 to one. So it's like, whoa, like look at all these foods that they're eating. This, there's, no, there's nothing in there that's processed and you still have the omega-6, omega-3 ratio of 12 to one. But what can we do about that then? 
So if we just add five ounces of salmon and we took away one tablespoon of olive oil, we'll get a ratio of two to two point seven to one. And even better, if we took away the salmon, we took we just added one tablespoon of fish oil and took away one tablespoon of olive oil, then we have a ratio of two point five to one, which is pretty ideal around the one one to four to one ratio of omega six and omega threes. So let's go over the female. So the female has 14 ounces of lean protein, 35 ounces of sweet potato, two servings of fruit, one avocado, two tablespoons of peanut butter, two tablespoons of olive oil, and three pounds of vegetables. So again, this is pretty optimal from the standpoint. If, if somebody ate like this every day, that I'd be like, wow, how do you do this? So with this person, this has an omega ratio of 19 to one. That's crazy, right? Look at it. Like you look at that and you think that's pretty awesome. Like who even eats like that? So what? So even that has a really high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. But what can you do about it? So let's just take away two tablespoons of peanut butter, add in one tablespoon of fish oil, and now the ratio is 1.7 to 1. That's, and that's amazing. So from the grand standpoint, it's not just taking away or adding. It's, it's doing both. Controlling your omega-6 intake and adding more omega-3s in. And Dr. House agrees. <laughs> So fish oil is good for you. And then we have all these other things that say, oh, really, I have a study that says otherwise. You have these news articles that talk about, oh, fish oil might not be great for prostate cancer, or fish oil actually doesn't help heart disease at all. Well, the thing with that is all these studies that they're doing, the design is faulty. So except for the Lionheart study, a lot of cardiovascular disease omega-3 supplementation trials didn't attempt to modify other consumption of the fat. They just kind of gave them fish oil and said, oh, well, that didn't really do anything. Well, as you guys know from the previous examples, like look at the diet that we use as examples. Even those diets had really high omega-6s. So imagine the regular American diet. They're eating just maybe salad dressing, they're adding all these different peanut butter, like they're using even maybe even worse, like going for fast food, which is extremely high omega-6s because of the oils that they use. Because omega-6 omega-6 oils just tend to be cheaper. So now 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 you think about it, like, whoa. Those studies actually aren't valid. They're not controlling for omega-6. And the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio are really high. And that study in there actually talks about it also. I can also link that to you guys later. What, what is it in the salad dressing that has so many omega-6s? Um, it's just the oils, the vegetable oils that they use. So you think about like even anything other than olive oil. So you got corn oil, rice bran oil, like any oil you can really think of is omega-6 is rich in omega-6s and it's just cheaper to produce like palm oil is really cheap peanut oil is really cheap and that stuff is really high in omega-6s okay thanks and the one thing we have to think about too the studies that they take sometimes they're eight to twelve week studies you have to draw it takes a really long time to simulate all the omega-3s into all the fossil lipid layers of the cell membrane so we think about oh the study's done for eight weeks that's pretty long or the study's done for even three months it's still actually not fully measuring how effective the omega-3s are because it's kind of like saying, oh, well, this person worked out for eight weeks and they look like they lost some weight. That's great. But you get someone working out for like two to three years consistently and the, the results are amazing. I'm sure most of you guys can agree with that. Same thing for fish oil. Imagine we're just, we live in an environment that's constantly driving systemic inflammation and basically feeding us omega-6s. When do we ever get omega-3s? Like I eat fish maybe twice a week, and the rest of all the weeks I have to supplement. So omega-6 are really important too, because they have really cool epigenetic changes to the transcription factors. And I think um, basically what that means is when you take omega-3s, it changes the way your genes are expressed to become less pro-inflammatory. So there's really cool clinical trial that showed even 1.8 grams under the optimal three grams of EPA DHA showed that you could be less anti less pro-inflammatory and less anti-autogenic. This study was up for 16, 26 weeks. The study also showed that, and here's the epigenetic changes actually, um, for any of you guys that really want to get deep, dig into that. But it's just really cool like showing that the epigenetic changes in that, that we can actually change how our genes are expressed just by taking omega-3s. And the study's down there too, for any of you guys that want that. And athletes, you're definitely not off the hook. So for a lot of athletes that train, you're going to have even higher free radical formation and you have higher trauma. So that leads to a more inflammatory state and it's going to be even worsened by omega-6 intake. And then 
get this, this study was really cool. So for, for older individuals, like these guys right here, <laughs> a clinical trial showed that taking 3.36 grams of EPA DHA slows down normal decline in muscle mass and function. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. But get this, they compared it to steroids and it was actually more effective than steroids for maintaining muscle mass. How crazy is that? Wow. So you think about what's happening in older individuals. The receptors on the cells are actually becoming desensitized because you're getting older and you're in this environment that just drives you to become less sensitive. So testosterone is less sensitive. So it makes sense that even these older individuals injecting testosterone, it's not working well because the foundation of it, the receptors aren't working well because you're basically building them out of omega-6s and not as efficient. So when you give them omega-3s, they're more receptive to the testosterone that they already have. And basically, you're making them more efficient. And the study's down there, too, for any of you guys that want that. So what else is fish oil good for? A lot of things. Um, increases bone density, helps with positive mood, insulin sensitivity, cerebral brain flow, and basically like everything. So, yeah. Um, now, concerns a lot. What makes a good fish oil? I think a lot of people always ask that. Make sure you're, the fish oil that you're getting is triglyceride-based and not ethyl ester. So a lot of people or a lot of companies, when they make fish oils, it's cheaper to produce the ethyl ester because when you make a fish oil, you have to source it from different fishes and sometimes, hopefully, not many different fishes. And you have to purify that because it, is, it does contain mercury depending on what, what the fish you get it from or the source you get it from. So what they'll do is they'll purify it, but to purify it, they have to use heat. And to use heat, you have to turn it to ethyl ester. That way, the oil doesn't go rancid. So, but when they do purify it, it takes more money to turn it back into a triglyceride, which a lot of companies just don't do and don't tell you, which is really bad. So, these two studies actually show how bioavailable triglyceride are compared to the ethyl ester. And if you care about the environment, pick one that's MSC certified, certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. Just because by 2050, we're probably going to decimate all of the fish on this planet because of our consumption. Like, we just can't keep up. Like, we're overfishing everything. So, like, every, everything that we're doing right now is contributing to that. And it's very likely by 2050, we won't really have any wild fish left. And it's kind of sad. Wow. Yeah. So, no sushi for anyone. <sighs> so, takeaways. So you want omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 2 to 1 or 1 to 1 daily. You can minimize your omega-6 intakes from excessive intake of nuts, peanut butter, vegetable oils to make sure that the omega-3s that you are eating are getting assimilated. And like I said before, make sure because this, when you eat a lot of omega-6s, you're using the same enzymes to intake the omega-6s, to process them. So getting 3 to 4 grams of total EPA DHA daily is probably a good, good point for a lot of clients. And being consistent, making sure you're doing it at, at least 90% of the time. All the benefits. And that's it. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about stress now, too, also. So stress is basically any stimulus that pushes one out of a homeostatic balance. Is it good or bad? Um, it depends. I mean, I think a lot, well, most of us know like stress isn't inherently bad, but too much of it is. So what happens when you get stress? All these things. I think we know um, we get a sympathetic shift into in our nervous system and we become stressed and all these different things happen, which is great in acute phase because we need that. We need that to get going. And this is a really cool thing I just want to talk about to give you guys a little bit of understanding. So in the first part where it says A, this is what actually happens when we have an efficient immune system. So you can see the yellow little yellow, little yellow curve. That's when we get an infection. And then when that happens, we get a little bit of inflammation response from the immune system to fight that infection off. And after that, we have immune suppression, basically immune resolution to shut that inflammation response off. So sometimes that doesn't happen with everyone. So if you look in the B example, where we have that infection, and then we have our immune system, our inflammation goes off, and then our resolution doesn't happen. This can, this can be caused from many different things. Um, it could be caused either we don't have the ability to resolve the information, either from a biochemical perspective where we're not eating good enough food to support that. And actually, there's some really cool companies that have resolution type supplements to help you resolve inflammation when you're not cutting off infection. And then the C part, this is, this is bad. So when you have an infection and you can't fight it off, 
And this is this works. And then you're constantly in front. Your immune system's like, okay, well, it upregulates, but then it's not strong enough to fight off the infection. And this happens a lot of a, people who are immune compromised. Oh wow. So case studies. Uh, we have a 35-year-old overweight male. Um, this is one of my clients. So he had a new job switch, so and it currently family stress, and his weight loss was stagnant for three weeks. And he was basically he listened to everything I said, like said, like, I said, eat this, do this, and he did it. And we were wondering why. So, and we were thinking, okay, um, maybe it is an inflammation problem. So what we did was, well, sorry, actually, sorry, you have to consider some things that were happening. So the new job switch and the, currently fam the current family stress. Um, psychological stress increases inflammation also. And these people that carry a little bit more fat will be more prone to inflammation because the fat cells also secrete more cytokines than normal healthy cells. So what did we do? So we cut his workout volume by 30% just because he was stressed out from everything else in life. So the one thing we could control was basically his physical stress. And we had a five minute silent breathing session for him in the morning and the afternoon for him just to reset to relax. And we had an inflammation supplement protocol. Um, this protocol is actually by Dr. Alice Vasquez. Uh, he talks a lot about inflammation, like a really smart guy. So we use curcumin to help decrease inflammation in the gut. We use fish oils to decrease systemic inflammation. We use GLA, which is actually an omega-6, but the omega this omega-6 actually blocks the receptors for all the omega-6s to be processed in an inflammatory pathway. We gave him some methylated B vitamins because he wasn't likely a good methylator and some vitamin D. Outcome in six days, he lost five pounds while lowering his workout volume and eating less. And that was like, you think that's crazy? He actually he didn't notice until he stepped on the scale. But the bigger thing was he could think clearly and he felt much better even when he was tired. Now the big thing with constant systemic inflammation is it basically eats away at us. It's, it's almost in itself an autoimmune disease. I mean, I wouldn't call it that, but I would think I would start pushing it that way because it does have pathogenesis of many other diseases. So like. He felt so much better. He was like, Henry, what did we do? And he was like, well, we just kind of controlled the information that was going on. Do you find a lot of people need to cut down their workout volume when they, they see weight loss stagnant or they see signs of inflammation, things like that? Uh, it depends. Um, if there's someone yeah. who's training like an athlete or, or something along those lines. Yeah, if they're, if they're definitely training like an athlete, I think uh, cutting out workout volume may be one of the things I would do just because if you're, if you're looking at their volume and – Everything else is controlled for. Workout volume is a stressor for them. Yeah. And the I stressors see. will drive more inflammation. Yeah, it definitely and actually, found that to be helpful. Uh, yeah. And this, along with the, the other things you mentioned, whether it's the breathing and, and some of those, I, I typically re recommend those types of supplementation. But yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, th I, mean, I think just like just so you touched on that, like breathe, the breathing is really important. And you guys might think, like, oh, five minutes of breathing, what is that doing? Well, that five minutes of breathing is stimulating the vagus nerve to become less pro-inflammatory. The vagus nerve controls a lot of different things, especially the gut also. So that time in breathing is really important. I don't think most people understand that. And here's a 41-year-old female executive. So this is an example. She works an average of 50 hours a week with highs of 60, lows of 40. So that's like, that's intense. Like an average of 50. So she's constantly overworked, constantly tired, constantly hungry. But for her, the one thing was we couldn't cut the workout volume out for her. Um, why is that? Well, well, actually, well, hold on. I'll get to it. So we're not cutting out the workout volume because for her, the big thing was that she's constantly stressed out and she has no output. So if you remember back to that, that little chart that I talked about, the resolution, from a, from a psychological standpoint, she needed to resolve the cycle of stress. So she's in her office, stressed out, meetings, and all these different things that she had to do. She had no way to output stress. So for her, working out was a way to resolve and for her to calm down and basically get her to relax. So for her, cutting out the workout probably was, wouldn't have been a good idea. And one thing we have to take into account for females also, this is really interesting. So energy expenditure goes up about 200, 300 calories during the luteal phase, so towards the end of your cycle. So usually for these, I usually tell my female clients, like when they're towards that end of the cycle, just adding a piece of fruit and that should help cover the increased energy expenditure. So for her, uh, basically her sleep improved, she was less hungry and she had less energy crashes. But the important thing was the restoration work afterwards too. So helping her resolve the stress. 
And that's it. Um, you guys have any questions? Um, this is really helpful. I like that um, you include the ratios and stuff like that because that's something I think I think a lot of people miss. Um, and obviously, it's extremely important. Um, the um, you so you mentioned curcumin, which I know you've been a fan of. Um, vitamin D. What about the um, research on vitamin D? How do you currently feel about the uh, about vitamin D supplementation overall? Um, overall, I'm not a, I'm not a super big fan of vitamin D supplementation. I think um, what we're doing is using vitamin D as like a surrogate endpoint to kind of be like, oh, well, your vitamin D is low. There's a problem. Well, vitamin D is like it doesn't have a lot of like downstream effects. I think it's 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 kind of it is downstream from everything else. So if we're not getting outside, we're not doing healthy things in terms of like for our lifestyle, our vitamin D is going to be blunted from many different pathways. And I think supplement thing with vitamin D is kind of just like replacing the canary in the coal mine. It's not, it's not really doing much, but there are certain contexts where inflammation, you should supplement vitamin D within an ounce of ASCAS goes into that. Okay. Hey, Henry, the, it didn't look like, or at least I couldn't see, I'm just using my phone, so the type is small, but for the, your female pay, client, did you do any supplementation modification for her? No, just because she had so much on her plate, the one thing I wanted her to do is just well, modify what I can modify when she's in me with the gym, so she can just relax, because she was, she was just so driven, like in terms of like, so there's so much psychological stress for her too, like in the work, in the work day for her. Okay, so like, she didn't, so she wasn't taking a fish oil supplement. Oh no, oh well, she, yeah, she was taking a fish oil supplement. We didn't, we didn't make a like dedicated information supplement protocol like we did for the male client. I see. Okay, and then could you, for the male client, um, can you talk again about the the. Um, the the six that you were giving him yeah yeah um so basically we were talking about uh sorry someone just came in the room <laughs> so the six supplements that we use for him um no you you see yeah just review again what you let's go back to that slide a second the gla that's what i wanted to know okay um what what about the gla well, didn't you say that that was a? Um, okay. It was an omega six, correct? It was an omega six. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it is. It is an omega six. It's a uh, gamma linoleic acid. Um, right. That is an omega six that is actually anti-inflammatory. Um, it's 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 the only one that I actually know that's anti-inflammatory. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Did, uh, did you have a question about that specifically? No, no, I was just, I was just curious because at the beginning you were talking about the fact that omega sixes were something that we we're trying to fix the ratio on. So I, it, I was just confused about the fact that you were including an omega six here. That's all. Oh, okay, yeah, I can definitely send some studies over to you too that talks about the GLA and how that, how that uh, pathway works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Cool. Um, anything else? Uh, nothing uh, right now. I appreciate it. If you could, um, if you want to send me over the slides, I'll put them in a PDF and share with everyone. And uh, that would be awesome. And just as long as I can see the references, I can actually find them because I'll want to download them and I can share them with everybody. Like, unless you have yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that sounds good. I could, uh, I'll, share, I'll share the slides over. Awesome. Henry, Henry, is there an, like a, an average recommended um, omega, uh, omega-3 supplementation that you would recommend um like the, the amount the amount to take yeah um so when you look at a omega-3 supplement look at the serving size on it um it'll tell you how much epa and dha it, it you get from it and mm -hmm. then from there a general recommendation usually is around like three grams of total epa dha um okay. and the cool thing about that is though if you do know that you're constantly eating a lot of omega-6s, you can just bump that up to get a better ratio. Okay. Does that thanks. Make sense? Yeah, very much. And thanks very much uh, for your materials today. It was really interesting. Really, really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Cool. Have a good one, uh, Naomi. Take it easy. Thanks. Bye, right. guys. Take it easy. Bye.